Okay, it's Wednesday, and I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And what does Wednesday mean? It means Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And that's how we're going to talk to uh, Jack Shriver, who is the manager, director of uh, uh, generation development in Hawaiian Electric. And he's got some really interesting things, developments to tell us about. Jack, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. And welcome to the, you know, driver holiday here. It's uh, <laughs> my new office. For the foreseeable also future. by remote, uh, Mitch Ewan from the University HNEI, uh, co-host of the show, uh, and speaking for the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Um, hi, Mitch. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Here I am, marooned on the beach, just opposite Coconut Island. It's really tough out here. I got to tell you. This, yeah, we live in a new abnormal society, yeah. and I'm and I'm really pleased to say that uh, ThinkTech, you know, d designed this remote thing. Uh, months ago. And so when coronavirus happened, uh, we were ready to do remote shows all day long. And that's what we're doing. And we're we're reaching a lot of people these days. It's great to have you. Um, so Jack, tell us uh, about uh, your projects. And, and you can refer to slides and, and then uh, Mitch and I will ask you about them. Uh, so why don't we pull up the slides and you can go through them one by one and describe what we're looking at. All right. All right. So, um, yeah, just as a brief intro, you know, it's a kind of a segue from the whole discussion about, um, uh, you know, being stuck at home and so on. You know, we're, we're going public and seeking the public's inputs on these projects at this point it, because the time frame, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more later on, is really kind of compressed for these projects. So we don't, um, although the whole COVID-19 pandemic has kind of put a pause on our social lives, it hasn't put a pause on our pursuit of the whole 100% renewable energy portfolio standard. So, um, and and some of these projects that I'm gonna describe are tied to the retirement of existing power plants that have uh, deadline dates. So we are going out and seeking public um, input on these things now, despite the fact that everybody's struggling with, with um, what's going on because uh, time does march on. So. I apologize for that. I wish we could do a lot more um, uh, in-person meetings like we had planned to, but uh, we are where we are. So um, with the slides then, um, do we have, can we bring those yeah. up? Okay, so we'll we'll step through these and then we'll talk about the justification for them later on. I think you guys are asking questions, but we have five proposed projects that we have bid into what uh, Hawaiian Electric is calling the phase two renewable and storage RFPs. RFPs were issued last August. Uh, bids were due in November. We put in these five bids, and we won't find out whether these projects are going to proceed until May. But uh, we're starting the process now of, uh, of the permitting because of that compressed time frame that I just mentioned. So here, this well, you're is going to find out in our, May, Jack. What's going to happen in May that's going to uh, let you proceed? Yeah, we're going to find out. Going? We're going to find out whether or not. Our, any of our five proposals were selected through the RFP process and any of the other bidders that fit in, and there, there are lots of other bidders, uh, whoever gets selected is gonna find out in May whether their proposals were accepted. Okay, we can talk more about that later, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so um, these projects here, if they're not selected, they, they won't go forward, but um, this is what we have uh, put together. So the first slide there was what we're calling the CEIP Battery Energy Storage System, or BESS, on the kind of sort of top right of the of the um, picture there, you can see our existing CEIP substation. And what we're proposing is uh, to the left of that, or just west of the existing CEIP substation, is to install a um, a 65 megawatt uh, six hour battery energy storage system. And on top of that, it also has a 50 megawatt half hour battery storage system, and it ties into that existing CEIP substation and uh, ties to the grid there at the 138 kV level. 
So that would be a new piece of uh, land that we're going to purchase if we're selected for this project and install a battery there. The second slide, view of that same project from the street, from the nearest street. As you can see, you can't really see it much. The, these batteries are uh, becoming these modules that look like shipping containers, basically. So um, that's a view from the street. And you can just see our CEIP substation there in the center of the photo. The battery is actually on the far side of it. And the point of this picture is you're really not going to be able to see this from, from uh, most public places. That's the first project yeah, there. We're on Oahu, is this? Are we talking out on Kihei, out on the, what part of Oahu? Um, it's, yeah, it's down in the southwest side, um, kind of down near the um, Star Advertiser building, actually. Okay. Near that, down near the Costco, down in Kapolei area. So um, the important thing there is it's tied directly into the existing substation so that it has a very robust interconnection with the grid and can serve as what in the utility sense would be called capacity. In other words, you can call on it when required and it's designed to a, a standard that is uh, to meet certain reliability criteria. Okay. So the second project, I think if we call up the third there's a few slides for this next one. This one, look, I, you may recognize the Kahe power plant in the sort of left hand side of the, the picture there. To the right, off in the um, on the slope, up to the on the south end of the Kahe Valley, there is our proposed battery energy storage system. This one is uh, quite a bit bigger. This is 135 megawatts for six hours, and again, same. Technology, battery storage um, in modularized containers. On the near end of it, there you can see the uh, step up transformer and the interconnection will tie into the existing uh, substation IA power plant. And I think we have some street views of that one too. Um, next slide there. This is uh, a view coming south on uh, the highway there power plant in the foreground you really can't see so this is a zoomed in view you can just barely see um, underneath the power lines uh, and and the trees there you can see some of those battery storage units on the hillside on the other side of the power plant and then the third view is as you're passing by the Kahi power plant if you looked to your left sharply up, up past the power plant um, you would see it in this picture but the the vegetation is blocking it, so the point there is it's it's not going to be much of a, a visual impact on, on the road there. So those are the two projects for Oahu to satisfy the overall capacity requirement for Oahu of 200 megawatts of storage for six hours plus 50 megawatts of storage for half an hour for a contingency reserve. Pattern. And um, and over on Maui, I think we have uh, some slides. Available for Maui coming up. Oh, these are the big island ones, so we'll talk about those first. Uh, we have two um, smaller projects slated for the uh, for the big island. One of them here at Keahole is a 12 megawatt one hour battery, and um, that is on our existing Keahole power plant site and uh, tied directly to that existing substation. And uh, and the next is a six megawatt one hour battery that would be installed at our Puna power plant over on the east side of the Big Island. And uh, so the total capacity for the Big Island of 18 megawatts for one hour. And those are, that's more of a regulating and contingency reserve requirement that we um, need to provide for grid stability on the Big Island. Um, and then on Maui, we have uh, one project that we're proposing. This is a map here. Oh, it looks like we're, I didn't include some of the graphics there. So we'll just go into the next slide. So here you can see, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Maui, um, we are uh, there on Pulehu Road, right across the street, right across Pulehu Road from the central Maui landfill is a 65 acre site that Hawaiian Electric has owned now for a while. It's outlined in blue. Um, and on that 65 acre site, we're proposing to use about 1.8 acres for what we're calling the Wayana BES, the battery energy storage system. You can go to the next slide. There's another computer rendering of what it would look like. This is looking from Pulehu Road out into the 
former um, sugar fields out here. And this, uh, this vehicle staging area in the foreground, that's, that's there right now. And what we're proposing to put in is just beyond that Atlanta BESS, which is a 40 megawatt four hour battery. And the interconnection is there to the right. The poles for all of these um, projects that we're proposing would be on, on the land. Uh, we're not proposing any new power lines to go outside of our property lines. So um, what you see is pretty much what you get. Mm -hmm. So those are the five projects there. Um, and uh, let's go back to context. Let's go back to context, Jack. Um, so sure. what we have here is uh, uh, what five separate RFPs, um, five separate uh, proposals in five separate processes, or is it all lumped up into one? Well, somewhere in the middle. Uh, so the company issued what we call the Phase Two RFPs. You know we we um, we're all, you know we're shooting for this 100% renewable goal in 2045. And in order to get there, we've got a, a constant drumbeat of renewable um, acquisitions. And when I say acquisitions, I mean new resources on the grid. So um, we completed the phase one RFPs uh, back in 2018 and uh, brought on a bunch of new resources, which are currently in the for design and construction phase. Phase two, RFP, there were three of them issued, one for Oahu, one for Maui, and one for the Big Island. And each of those RFPs um, solicited bids for different amounts of renewable generation with storage attached, and also separate standalone energy storage requirements. Um, as the utility developer, what we focused on was the standalone energy storage requirements because those are what we consider to be grid reliability requirements. Um, and that's what we're obligated to participate in. So because of the um, requirements of the RFP, we had to divide up our bids into two projects on Oahu, two projects on the Big Island, and one project on Maui. So there's three RFPs, five bids. You were talking about how, uh, you know, this, this you know, gets to be decided in May, but uh, you have to have a separation, don't you, between uh, Hawaiian Electric as the potential developer, and you as a developer, and the people who decide which which are the winning projects in May. How does that work? Yeah, it's really a um, uh, really important process. So back in 2008, the Public Utilities Commission issued what's called the Framework for Competitive Bidding. And that serves as the baseline document that sets up the criteria that the, the company needs to follow, the processes that the company needs to follow in order to um, issue RFPs like this. And in particular, once those RFPs are issued, if the utility um, is going to be in those RFPs as a bidder, then it lays out the processes that are required for that. So. In order to be fair to all the bidders and not to ensure that the utility doesn't get uh, any kind of unfair advantage in the bidding process, the company developed a uh, strict code of conduct and submitted that to the Public Utilities Commission. That was approved by the PUC. We all had to um, read and get training on this and uh, sign a bunch of uh, acknowledgement documents. And uh, so we had to follow those rules pretty carefully. And the rules basically established two teams inside the utility, one of which is the RFP team. And those are the folks that develop the requirements, they issue the RFP, they've been discussing it and getting it approved by the public commission. And as the bids come in, and they're the ones who evaluate these proposals uh, on the basis of the, of the evaluation criteria that were approved by the commission. On the other hand, there's the self-build team, and that's the team that I'm on. And we are the developers for the utility. We are not allowed to talk to the RFP team about anything related to this RFP. I have to communicate with the RFP team through the same methods that any other bidder does. I have to put in questions on the website. I didn't get any advanced uh, notice of the RFP um, aside from what was made public. And uh, so I have no, you know, the rules are set up to ensure that I don't have any sort of 
inside knowledge or inside track on uh, on the evaluations. I should also wine, say that. Why is the wine? Go ahead, finish. Just, just one more thing. I just want to mention the whole RFP process is overseen by an independent observer that's selected by the Public Utilities Commission and that reports to the Public Utilities Commission on the fairness of the process. So, why, why does the Wine Electric want to do this? Why does Wine Electric want to be a developer uh, in this company? Why don't you just leave it up to you know the, the market um, to provide developers who would bid competitively and so forth? Why do you want to be in that? Well, I think um, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, we're in the business to be in business. Um, and so just like any other uh, company, we, uh, this is our core business. We, we generate, transmit, and distribute energy, and uh, now we want to store energy too. So that's one reason um, from a business perspective. From a system operations perspective, having resources that we own and operate as opposed to resources that are managed through a power purchase agreement contract, um, I think provides some flexibility and um, advantages to the company in terms of our ability to, to uh, do what we need to do to keep the lights on on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, also, you know, I, I, we feel like we have a, an obligation to, to um, make sure that the pricing is fair, you know. And um, so we put in proposals that we think are very, uh, that are, uh, fair cost, and in, in the event that other developers can't meet or beat those um, prices, then we can provide a really uh, solid and reliable proposal to our customers. The other so you might win on you may, might win on some of these projects, but not others. Correct. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I mentioned that the RFPs were soliciting a whole bunch of renewable energy generation. We didn't put in any bids for generation, so um, we're not actually even competing in the, the generation aspect of the RFPs. Um, I'm, you know, so, revealing a little so bit to my competitors out there at the moment. But. Well, we have to be careful not to tell them too much. Eh? Well, what about the, the technology uh, that you're using for storage? I guess the storage technology in each of the projects you're proposing is going to be pretty much the same. Uh, that is like your subcontractor who provides the storage, uh, you know, for the storage uh, devices. Uh, it's going to be the same kind of device in each case, right? If you've settled on it as appropriate for one, I assume you've settled on it as appropriate for the others. Am I right? Yeah, correct. Uh, in this case, we did. I mean, we did consider um, mixing different technologies. Um, in particular, you know, I mentioned that on different islands, the, the use case for the energy storage projects is slightly different. So in some cases, it might have been, uh, it was worth considering different technologies. But in this case, we did go with the same technology for all of our bids. Well, and one other assumption, Jack, and, and that is, you know, in the maps, you show that there, there are locations allocated for these projects. Um, and all these locations are proximate to or included in the existing wine electric, um, you know, facility. Um, and I take it that the out the, the spaces, the locations, would, would be the same for anyone who bids. In other words, you, the wine electric doesn't have a particular advantage um, because the project is taking place on its land. Uh, anybody who bids on the project. Uh, would would be able to use that land? Am I right? Yeah, that's correct for any of the land that we own. So, one of the requirements of the RFP process was that any sites that the self build team would use for uh, on Hawaiian Electric owned property would be made available to all bidders. So, the Kahe site, the uh, Waiena site on Maui and the Puna and the Keaholi sites on the Big Island are all currently owned by the company and they were made available to all bidders. Mm -hmm. The CEIP one is uh, not currently owned by Hawaiian Electric, so that would be a site that we would purchase. And that is, um, so that was not made available to anybody else. Mm -hmm. Mitch, your turn, I'm sure you're bursting with questions. Well, I'm 
Yeah. So what about the interconnecting equipment? Because, uh, I mean, I read through the RFP and some of those uh, interconnections are like eye-wateringly expensive, like, you know, $4 million for a big switch switching gear. Is that also available? Or is that not even there and, and people would have to, um, you know, install it anyway? Well, um, the cost of the interconnection stuff that you're talking about has to be included in each developer's bids. Yeah. Included those costs in our proposals and other people have to include it in theirs as well. The interconnection locations of those substations that I showed where it ties into the grid, those yeah. were made available okay. to all the bidders. Okay, that sounds pretty good. So have you, I guess you can't say which um, battery manufacturer you guys have uh, selected yet because that would be like giving the, giving the away, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, uh, we're not sharing that yet. Okay, okay. all right, okay. So what kind of a lifetime <laughs> on the batteries are you expecting? I mean, we, ha we live in a hot tropical environment. I mean, the battery of choice for everybody is lithium ion batteries. I, you know, there's variations of that. But, you know, at h &E I, we've done a lot of work on evaluating batteries, and uh, lithium batteries generally don't hold up to like 40 or 50 years. So at what stage do you think these batteries would have to be replaced or what kind of a lifetime uh, are you expecting out of them? Or is that once again competitive? Yeah, that's a yeah, really good um, question. No, I mean, we're proposing 20 year projects. So the okay. design life cycle of these projects would be 20 years. Uh, we based our proposal on that, our uh, maintenance plan on that, and what's called a um, capacity maintenance agreement, which is basically a, an agreement with the battery manufacturer that they will um, maintain and supplement, if necessary, the batteries to, to keep the uh, guaranteed um, power and energy requirements throughout that 20 year life cycle. Right. So we don't actually put in, at the beginning of the project, we don't actually build out every one of those um, modules that you saw in the, in the graphics there. We lay the foundations and we put in the electrical connections and the duct work, but over the life of the, and then at the beginning of the project, we put in enough of those modules for the first couple of years. And then depending on the usage, those first couple of years, um, we would augment the project with additional batteries or replace things that fail or et cetera. All right, okay. Well, let's let's uh, you know let's remember that we're in the context of um, of coronavirus, and I'm sure that affects or it could affect your May decision process. It could also affect the uh, construction timetable. Uh, so, what what do you what do you anticipate? I mean, what was the original plan for a construction timetable and a, and a turnover date for these projects? And how, uh, if you know. Uh, would that be affected by the coronavirus? It's affecting everything else. Uh, on the other hand, we, you know, we, we certainly want to see renewables developed at a high rate of speed. We want to see storage uh, developed at a high rate of speed. So how fast can we assume this will be developed given you know, the uncertainties of the virus? Right, well, does, um, you know, the, the it's important to mention that the basis of the RFPs for at least for Oahu and for Maui is to provide replacement capacity and replacement energy to enable the retirement of the AES coal plant here on Oahu and of the Kahului power plant on Maui. In order to be able to retire those generating uh, power plants, those resources, you need to have replacements both for capacity and energy. So. The timetables written into the RFPs were were based on that. So we have um, guaranteed commercial operation dates for these projects that are that are pretty tight, especially for Oahu, because the uh, AES's um, power purchase expires in uh, 2022, and so we need to. And you know, the selection is going to happen in May of 2019, so. Uh, when you talk about the permitting process, you have to get through um, permitting, and then of course, you know, design and procurement and construction and testing, and have everything done and working in time 
to make sure that it's up and running before AES uh, power plant um, fires. And similarly on, on Maui, uh, the Kahului power plant. So the timelines are tight and uh, they are not, there's no um, relief in sight for that timeline. So as, as a result, you know, even though we have, we're all, uh, you know, working from home and um, we're making changes to the way we do our initial uh, public outreach and permitting process, take that into account. So we actually, um, I would just like everybody to, that's uh, watching, if you're interested in these projects or if you have questions about them, if you would go to our website, we have a, a single website for all these projects, which is www.hawaiianelectric.com slash self build projects. And that's a, on that website, you can find um, information about the projects. You can find presentations about them. You can also have an individual email address for each of the five projects. You can click on that and you can um, submit your comments or questions and uh, we will get back to you on those. And um, we're also scheduling where we would have normally had uh, public meetings and meetings in well, person. Well, you started them, did you started them. You started uh, public meetings a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, we we well, attended. We, it was there yeah. also, uh, was it, uh, but then I guess uh, right after that, the coronavirus got more serious, and I think you must have put them off, eh? Yeah. So we had um, we did have some uh, neighborhood board meetings that we were going to attend. Those got canceled. Uh, we'd had some uh, public meetings um, scheduled, and we have replaced those with virtual public meetings. Um, for Oahu, again, the, the, you know, the details are on the website, and um, also a virtual public meeting for Maui and uh, and the Big Island as well. We'll be transmitting a presentation either over an online platform. On Oahu, we're going to use WebEx, and uh, Maui, we're going to use um, community television. And we'll, uh, same with Big Island. And then we'll have uh, the ability for people to uh, email in their questions, and we'll answer those questions live on the air. And, um, and we're hoping that this method is effective and that people are kind of maybe sitting around looking for something to do and they'll tune in uh, or click on the link and join us and put in their questions and comments and I'll be there to answer them. Yeah, it was definitely better than some of those late night movies they've been throwing at us lately. Yeah. So not Mitch, you got what? Not as good as the Hawaii reruns. <laughs> sure. And of course, this is right after they finish watching all the Hawaiian Electric appearances on Think Tech, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, have, you, have you had any kind of hint on what the community acceptance uh, might be? I mean, just looking at what you're showing us, they look, it looks pretty innocuous. It's just shipping containers. It's not putting a big wind turbine in somebody's backyard or taking ag land for PV arrays, so I would ex I would expect it would be fairly uh, easy uh, to get this through. But any any indications that that may not be the case, or is it still too early um, in the process? I think it's too early to tell. Like, you know, the community has uh, asked us the ones that we've interacted with so far um, have had a lot of really uh, good questions about uh, the technical aspects. Why is this needed? So how much is it going to cost? When does it go in? What are the you know? So um, a lot of good questions at this point. We haven't really had anybody, um, uh, you know, sort of commit one way or the other about whether they're in favor of it or not. Yeah. Well, so it's it's a, it, it doesn't the kind of project where you expect any any opposition. Though this this is all equipment, you know, essentially within the existing facility. Yeah. Who would complain? Well, you know, they had the well, big. Yeah, people there. have all kinds of different concerns. Yeah. Okay. I would think safety would, might be a concern, but you know, there was no, there was no indication there was any housing uh, nearby, so that if there was some kind of an accident, uh, it wouldn't affect the, the actual uh, private citizens here. So, so it looks like a pretty benign project, really. Well, that is. So, the, what about the, the uh, plan? What What is the economics here? I mean, you, you're in a we're in a strange place. Um, you know, oil, we had a show earlier today, is down. Uh, I don't know if it's the kind of oil that Hawaiian Electric is buying, uh, the, um, you know, that special crude that it buys, the light sulfur kind 
Um, but yep. but yeah, oil in general is down at ten dollars or less per barrel right now. It's a, yeah, no kidding. It's actually less than ten dollars. Um, wow. That's so you know. I mean, and if that if if Hawaiian Electric has the benefit of that, well, then you know, then then oil should be cheaper, and uh, and that would that would suggest we have to keep on using oil. Uh, I don't know about coal, <laughs> AES and the coal. I don't know, um, but but. Um, at the same time, you have, you have a problem of people who are, I think this has been recognized, people who don't have any money and may not pay their utility bills. This is a problem. If there's a lot of people like that in the state, and it seems like they may be, uh, then your cash flow is impacted. Um, at the same time, if you get approval in May or soon anyway, um, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to come up with the capital to build these projects, and uh, you know, Mitch was suggesting that even the interconnect is is millions. Um, so, where does that come from? Is that in-house money that you would use? Is that uh, special funding? Uh, how are you going to finance the development of all these projects? Well, like like most developers, we would finance these projects through a mix of you know debt and equity. We take out some um, loans. And um, also, you know, sell some stock to raise funds for our capital program. Um, we don't finance projects individually; we finance them as a you know, as a sort of package. So uh, we would be financing these projects once they uh, once they get approved, uh, assuming that they get approved, of course, you know, and selected in May, and then we would go to the Public Utilities Commission and seek their Final approval before we start um, spending, you know, borrowing and spending a lot of money. Basically, the way it works in terms of cost recovery is that once the projects are built and placed into service, and that they're certified that they're working and providing value to our customers, then they get incorporated into rate base, and we base our our electricity rates on. You know, that's one of the factors that goes into our rates. Yeah, that's the next part of my question is, okay, so you go through the whole process and you and you construct and everything, turn it over, you know, uh, and now it's part of the rate base and all. Um, so question is, uh, we know that the system will be more reliable with projects like this. We know that, that's just logic. Um, but will it affect, will these projects affect the rates ultimately that, uh, that rate payers pay? Aside from the benefit of reliability, will there be any benefit to them in terms of the rates? Will it be more or less the same? Yeah, good question. Um, and the answer is, I don't know. Um, I think that the RFP team, that's their primary um, criteria. They're actually evaluating each individual bid or mixing the bids into different combinations and analyzing them as different portfolios to select the best, best jigsaw puzzle of uh, renewable resources and energy storage projects to um, to mitigate the costs. Um, I think you know one of the things that we have to be aware of is that uh, the AES coal plant, you know, as much as people may object to use of coal, uh, it does provide some of the lowest cost energy here on Oahu, and when that gets retired. Um, if the replacement uh, resources are a higher uh, price, then then that will impact the rates. Um, so the, the overall impact we won't know until the RFP has completed their deliberations. And um, one one thing I would say though is that the more we you mentioned you know this oil dip in price and then it's going to bounce back at some point and that volatility in the pricing is a, is a cost all unto itself. One of the advantages um, of transitioning to renewable resources that are generated locally is that I think that we'll see more price stability. Whether that price stability is you know, higher or lower, you know, remains to be seen, but but it will be less volatile. Mitch. Yeah, I had to turn my microphone off. I'm right beside the airbase, so like I had helicopters flying all over here. Uh, I'm actually uh, pretty well out of questions. I mean, I think uh, you gave us a very good overview. 
of uh, what the current situation is. I mean, you're kind of constrained in you know getting in drilling into the details uh, because it's still uh, a uh, competitive uh, situation. So. Frankly, I don't have any additional questions, except I just want to make a comment. I wish you the best on this project. It's a huge project, and uh, only a submariner or submariner could probably manage this. So that's you. Oh, oh <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. But... Yeah. <laughs> it takes a special kind of management skill. You know, I, I appreciate managers more these days. And I, you, yeah. know, man, you, know what they, you know what managers do? They plan. Well, how many we could use more days? planning in connection with the coronavirus. So one other thing comes to mind, though, Jack, is that, um, you know, wh where does this fit in the march to renewables? Where does it fit? You know, I mean, I mean, why do we care about these storage facilities? Why are these storage facilities important in the overall plan? Yeah, so... Um... Generally speaking, you know, with renewables, um, you know, everybody has been saying this for years. They, they're there when they're there, and they're not when they're not. And so, um, energy storage. Uh, up to this point, we've been able to manage the grids by um, accepting all of the, well, nearly all the renewable energy that is generated, whether it's generated at the right time or the wrong time. We've been able to dial back the firm power plants. Uh, to accommodate that generation, and then that generation um, goes away due to you know whatever the sun going down or the wind stopping, then we are able to ramp up. In the meantime, uh, you know we've kind of reached the limit, uh, or we're reaching the limit of how much we can do that, and so we're reaching the point where the renewable generation capacity is going to exceed the demand, uh, certainly during certain times of the day and and that has to be that way in order to produce the appropriate amount of energy to, to fuel the islands and to keep the islands running throughout the day um, so in order to even that out and store that energy so that we can deliver it when our customers need it energy storage is 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 the key to making that happen yeah so it saves money and it's more reliable and it's more efficient that's what I take out of that uh, and how about you Jack you're Am I right about it? You want to change my change my assumption? Well, I think that um, I don't like the the um, jury's still out on whether it's going to be um, lower cost and and uh -huh. more efficient and so on. I mean, I think you, we do have to take into account the fact that um, you know with a with existing technology. And with our current arrangement of renewables, that energy is consumed the moment that it's generated, and we only generate as much as we consume. So there's a there's a you know an elegance to that, and um, there's an efficiency. One of the one of the issues associated with energy storage is that any energy storage technology has an efficiency factor. And so, uh, for most of your battery systems, which you know, one of the reasons why battery systems are the are the current favorite for most um, utility scale projects, anyway, is that they are highly efficient from an electrical perspective. They're about, I'd say, about eighty-five percent efficient. In other words, you know, if you put in hundred kilowatt hours of energy, you're going to get eighty-five kilowatt hours out. But you do lose those fifteen kilowatt hours. You know, about that fifteen percent of the amount of energy. So um, the more energy storage that you use, um, the more energy that you're um, that you're uh, not delivering to your customers, you're, you're losing it through storage. So the efficiency has to be carefully balanced. Mm -hmm. um, we picked these um, battery storage systems and the, the technologies that we did is because of that efficiency number. Because if you think about it, the second order effect of having of using a potentially a lower efficiency energy storage thing is you therefore need to build bigger renewable power plants, uh, more wind, more PV, um, and the higher the the efficiency of the energy storage technology that you select, the less energy you lose in that storage process, the more efficient and less generation 
so efficiency saves money for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I'm I'm also wondering, you know, you're the um, director of uh, generation development. I don't know if I have that exactly right, but some some word. What's your title? Director of Generation Project Development. Okay, so <clears throat> how does it fit? you know, your your regular title of this project. And the other thing I get, you must be, this is a complex project. I mean, it's really five projects. So how, how, this must be taking a fair amount, if not all of your time lately. Can, can you talk about that? Uh, sure, I have, uh, so um, my, my uh, division was created to be, um, well, as the, as the title suggests, to develop any projects for new power generation. That has expanded in the last couple of years into energy storage, which is no, technically isn't generation. But, um, you know, we did build, we built two power generation in the last couple of years. And um, we're looking forward to the opportunity, uh, if we get selected here, to get into the energy storage field. Um, we have a, a uh, you know relatively small lean team of folks that are focused on on these projects and um, but when we if we win the project we create you know we create a real uh, cross functional team throughout Hawaiian Electric to uh, make sure that we dot all of our eyes and cross all of our T's and uh, we put a lot of effort into hiring uh, really good um, consultants and contractors to execute these projects. But it does take a lot of time, uh, particularly in the permitting phase. Yeah. Mitch? Well, I ran out of questions uh, 10 minutes ago. Okay. And you followed up All with right. excellent. Okay. <laughs> well, Jack, thank you so much for coming down and telling us about this and showing us about it. I mean, it's just, it's another dimension that we have to understand about what Hawaiian Electric is doing and what we need to do to move forward. And I, I compliment uh, Hawaiian Electric on, you know, taking the bit this way and actually um, it's leadership. It's leadership in a business sense. Uh, so it's very good. And I, I hope you get at least some of these projects approved uh, in May. Uh, maybe when you do, you can come back and talk to us about, you know, what happened and, and what you see going forward at that time. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for your time and, uh, and interest in it. I think, um, uh, with respect to the leadership role, um, you know, this, as our former CEO would, would tell you, this is going to be a real team effort to get us from here to 2045. It's not going to be just the utility. Uh, everybody's going to have to pitch in to make this work. Okay, Mitch, it falls on you to, you know, to thank Jack and to say farewell to our viewers. You want to, you want to, you want to take the bit on that? Yeah, I'm going to do it really quick. Jack, thank you so much for your time and effort and all you're doing for us here in Hawaii. And with that, it's aloha, and we'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>